Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and our programming of Community Matters. We are discussing today, the obviously, the upcoming election. The focus on Community Matters has always been for the past couple of months on what would be happening on November 5th. So today we have a couple of guests from our nation's capital. And I like to refer to uh, people that work there as uh, representatives of K Street. Now, K Street in our history of our country was the place where all the influence was uh, centralized, uh, influence with Congress and with the uh, federal government, as well as much more, uh, out in the states as well. Obviously, nobody actually, well, maybe a couple people, a couple firms might actually still be on K Street, but the reputation has gone far. So why K Street? Because these are the people that have to know what's happening in American politics to do their jobs well. So I'd like to welcome, actually a former partner of mine, uh, Dennis Dwyer. Dennis, welcome, and Matt Hoekstra, who is his partner. Obviously, the good thing about uh, K Street is that the people who work there actually can go both ways, but we do both ways, meaning Republican or Democrat, depending on the client, but um, we do have specialities. Dennis will tend to a little bit to the D's, and Matt will be tending a little bit to the R's, so that'll give us a, some perspective. So welcome, gentlemen. We look forward to our conversation. And to help us this morning, our usual panel, we have Colin Moore, pundit from the University of Hawaii and head of some political science department up there. And then we have Chad Blair from Hawaii's favorite newspaper, Civil Beat, and obviously Jay Fidel. Uh, with that, let's get started. Um, Dennis, since uh, you've been there forever, um, I wanted, wanted to ask you, give me something. What, what's the prognosis? The, I, I, uh, you guys have a bet on who's going to win the uh, upcoming uh, presidential election? Well, right now, Matt and I don't have uh, a bet going, uh, but uh, we clearly come at uh, at the the race from uh, at least in terms of the race for president uh, from different perspectives. I think it's fair to say, and this will sound like uh, you heard this on the national news as well, but this is clearly the closest presidential race, at least in my lifetime uh, or my uh, voting career. Um, when you look at the fact that uh, the average of polls in those seven battleground states that will probably determine who wins the election, in, in the differences in terms of the average of polls, I'm not talking about a specific poll, is oftentimes a fraction, meaning less than uh, uh, 1%. Uh, and so here we are now just eight days out from the election. And in those seven states, uh, we're talking about fractions of a difference. Matt might have a, a, a different perspective on that, but uh, it's clearly the closest uh, that I've been aware of. I, I think uh, I agree completely with Dennis. I think in terms of polling, it's shaping up to be such a close race. I think to look at it on the other hand, if you look at 2008, 2012, 2016, 2020, uh, you'd have to go back to 2008 to see the last time that pollsters really got a presidential race right. Um, and by that, I mean 2008, um, I think very accurately predicted um, an Obama victory. 2012 overestimated the support that, um, that Mitt Romney ended up getting in that race. 2016 certainly underestimated the support that President Trump ended up with winning that race. And then 2020 got the result correct because uh, President Biden ended up winning, but the margins were much narrower than predicted by a lot of the top pollsters. So I think the polls, as Dennis said, 
have it just completely neck and neck, but there could be a systemic failure in terms of polling like we saw in some of the previous cycles. Wow, you got it. I see you nodding your head, Colin. You want to jump in on this? I, I mean, I agree entirely with what Dennis and Matt said. I think it's very possible. Um, I mean, the polls clearly show this race completely tied, but I think it's very possible there has been a, a systemic error somewhere, and Harris or Trump will win by more than more than we're thinking. Uh, Chad, I would love it if we didn't have to pull presidential elections after this year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking back to Gore and Bush in, in 2000, and um, while I have read all the same articles and some of the same data as these gentlemen have, um, one wonders what would the media, and I'm in the media business, actually talk about and report on? Well, Madison Square Garden, obviously from yesterday and any number of things, but I wonder how will it change? How would it change? I know you can't get rid of polling. I know there's money involved, but I too wonder if they really are just screwy that somehow they've messed up the thing i hear over and over again is the younger generations I, I know pollsters try new methods to reach out to people texting and opting in here and therefore but i wonder whether they're just missing entire demographics go ahead dennis i was just going to say to chad's point on polling um you know originally it was based on landlines and who has a landline anymore and now they use auto dialers so you right. are picking up uh, certainly uh, some uh, mobile phone users uh, as it relates to that. But it really is, I think, a question uh, now that we all have, uh, um, you know, uh, caller ID. I don't know about you, but when I see a number I don't know uh, or somebody's name doesn't come up, I don't answer the phone. And so I, I think there's that a, a dynamic that's that's out there as well that calls into question the validity of of polls as just a general matter. I, I totally agree. I think there's a there's a familiar refrain too. You know, you hear a lot of people in D.C. or in politics say, "I've never gotten a call from a pollster. Yeah. I've never been polled, uh, no matter what your age is." And people kind of always wonder about that. I think the other thing that um, people wonder about is people put a lot of stock into the pollster ratings that you see uh, in the, some of the aggregate aggregate polling websites. So Re Real Clear Polls or uh, Nate Silver or Nate Cohn, some of these people that um, analyze how good pollsters are. And one thing that's interesting is some people in the professional political class look at some of the pollsters that might have a B plus rating or an A minus rating and say, nobody takes that seriously. But sometimes the reason these pollsters have a good rating is because they pull a lot of people. So they have, um, you know, a, a good number, a good sample number. Um, and then the second thing is they may have guessed the correct result last time. So <laughs> if you look at a pollster um, that, you know, may have been biased towards Trump in 2020, they might have a inflated pollster rating um, on some of these sites because they guessed the result more correctly than others did in 2020. But at the same time, they might not be a very good pollster in terms of methodology. So that gives us the uh, foundation that we're dealing with. But the seven states, Dennis, that you mentioned quickly. Yeah, Matt, Matt, Matt will help me here if I miss them. But uh, sort of starting from the upper mid Midwest, uh, I go Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, uh, and uh, who am I missing? Matt? North Carolina and Arizona. And Arizona. Yeah. So uh, tell us what's happening. Is that are the um, or is the presidential race race uh, having any effect on uh, what's happening in those states? Uh, Matt, you, you you seem to have an interest there. Sure. Um, I, I think one thing that's fascinating about the seven states is there are a lot of competitive Senate races housed within those seven states. So um, we're going to see some, you know, a lot of the action, a lot of the the states that people are watching because they're interested in the presidential, but also interested in the outcome of the Senate are going to be focused on some of those seven states that Dennis just mentioned. Um, I think, you know, people tend to like to look at these states as as in groupings. So you've got Miss you've got Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania that people look at together, right? As a collective Rust Belt um, state, 
And that's interesting. And I think that yields a lot of the hypothesis that, okay, Pennsylvania looks neck and neck in the polls. Michigan and Wisconsin look fairly neck and neck in the polls. You can cherry pick individual polls and come up with a better story for one candidate or the other based on perhaps Arab American turnout and enthusiasm in Michigan, um, where the, you see more Arab Americans than you see in the other two states. Or um, you could look at the state's demographics slightly differently. Um, but people typically look at those three states and think they tend to move in a similar direction. Um, some of the pollsters that I respect the most have been saying that, that they would expect right or wrong, um, they're going to move in a similar direction. Um, and then maybe just at the closest of margins, you could see Michigan maybe go one way and Pennsylvania go a different way. Um, but if there's any sort of systemic error in the polling, like we've talked about before, all three are probably moving in the same direction, either towards Trump or towards Harris. Um, in the other um, states, you know, people look at tend to look at Arizona and Nevada similarly, um, just because of where they are. I'm not sure that that's completely fair. It is um, there are different issues at stake. Um, you know, there's been a lot of um, interest in uh, the candidates and how they've treated unions and union employees in Nevada. Um, there's a huge service industry there. So you've seen both candidates adopt a no taxes on tips um, as part of their platform. That's probably a little bit of pandering on both sides to the state of Nevada and how important it is. Um, but also, if you're looking at it in terms of electoral votes, one thing with Nevada that you have to keep in mind, it's only six electoral votes. So it's less than the other six states that we're talking about here. And that actually does matter because in a scenario where you take the states where Trump is doing marginally better in than Harris, if you look at Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia, which are three of the states where um, I think you could say Trump maybe has a slight polling advantage versus the other three maybe being a slightly towards Harris or more in the toss-up, pure toss-up category. If you took those three out of the seven and gave them to Mr. Trump, and then handed him Nevada, that would not be enough to tip the Electoral College if he doesn't win one out of the three Rust Belt states. So you start to unpack the states a little bit and say, well, the three Rust Belt states might move in the same direction. Trump might do better in four out of the other seven states that we're talking about. But which states you give to which candidate really matters when you're trying to get to 269 for a tie or 270 for a win. So there are a lot of different outcomes focused around these seven states. And the polling really across all seven is incredibly close. So we, I know I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we have some early vote. Um, early in-person and mail-in um, uh, ballots that we can attempt to analyze and unpack in some of these states, although some states are, like Pennsylvania, are doing mail-in ballots only, not in-person. And some of these states, um, you know, for the last several cycles, like Nevada, have been heavily in-person in early voting and mail. So there's a lot of historical data we can look at there. But um, in any case, those are the seven states. There's a lot going on. Um, and there's a lot at stake in terms of which state you're giving to which candidate. Again, uh, Chad, Jay, uh, Colin, any? I, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about some of the Senate races and the two that I've found most interesting. I mean, there, there's several, several of them going on, but I was hoping I could ask you a little bit about Ohio and Nebraska. And I understand, Matt, that you've done some some work in Ohio. So Sherrod Brown, um, you know, is maybe folks in Hawaii aren't, aren't aware, is a, a Democratic senator who's represented Ohio for a long time. He's really strong on labor issues. Um, and there's an interesting race in Nebraska where you have an independent candidate who's who's uh, quite competitive. So if you could just give us your thoughts on a couple of those or any others that you think are, are worth talking about, I, I'd really be curious to hear. Absolutely. So starting with Ohio, um, that is a race that is really high on both parties' list. Um, and I think it's a race, I'm glad you asked about it, because I think it's flying a little bit under the radar um, in terms of how much we're hearing about some of these other races. Um, but rest assured, National Republicans, National Democrats, everybody is paying very close attention to that race. Um, Sherrod Brown, who you mentioned, the incumbent, has been in office. He won in 2006 and won re-election in 2012 and 2018. 
Um, in 2012, he won re-election in a state that delivered Obama a victory in his second term. In 2018, um, he won in in a, in a in between two Trump victories, right in Ohio, 2016 and 2020, in a state that pretty clearly has moved red. We didn't talk about that as a Rust Belt toss-up um, because essentially it's not anymore. Ohio has moved um, certainly more into the Republican category. Um, so he has certainly a very tough race. Um, you look at who he's running against. Bernie Moreno is somebody who. Um, had a lot of success in the primary. He's not somebody who's ever been elected to public office before, but he was able to defeat um, several seasoned candidates um, and built a pretty good coalition um, of counties that, that he won by in the primary um, with President Trump's endorsement. So this race is I think very close. If you look at the political betting markets, which we all do every day, um, I think it's a pretty close to a 50-50 race. I think that's a, a, a fair assessment of where that race is today. I think if I had to try to predict what would happen eight days from now, I would say that the incumbent Sheriff Brown is in a very tough position because um, at the presidential level, um, you know, certainly I don't think Vice President Harris is running, is putting as many resources in Ohio as she is other places. Um, just because, um, look, President, um, uh, 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 sorry, um, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton um, put resources there in 2016, uh, did not come very close in the end. President Biden put some resources there at the end in 2020 when the polls looked like they were moving towards him quite a bit. Um, and ended up losing, however, by similar margin that Clinton did in 2016. So I don't think anyone would blame Vice President Harris for not putting a lot of resources or organization into Ohio. The problem is, um, you know, President Trump, we know, is going to turn out a lot of the rural voters in Ohio. 85 out of 88 counties in Ohio are fairly rural. rural and we know that um, President Trump is going to get a lot of those people to turn out that perhaps didn't turn out in 2018, the last time that Sherrod Brown was on the ticket. We also know um, that at the end of these races, um, you know, if, if if one candidate has momentum or or has a has an exercise base, and the other campaign isn't really doing a lot to turn out voters in that state, sometimes a race that's you know polls at five or six might end up at eight or ten, um, just because of that enthusiasm gap and the lack of a turnout model. Um, so what Sherrod Brown really has to rely on, and I would argue, and I think Dennis would agree, he is uniquely positioned to rely on, is that he will get some Trump voters to vote for him. Um, he has a very unique record as an incumbent. Um, like you said, he's very strong on labor and on uh, with union households. Those are some of the households, the blue collar households that have gone for Trump in Ohio. Um, so we know some of those people um, are going to turn out for Sherrod Brown. Um, the question is, will it be enough? And there was a campaign leak, um, I believe, uh, from last week that said from the Sherrod Brown's campaign that if, you know, if the if the result of the top of the ticket was uh, perhaps Trump winning by eight points or less, um, that they felt pretty good about the state of the race. But if it was more than eight points, that that got into a territory where they didn't feel great about the state of the race. I think some of the polling averages have it around eight right now, um, but some high quality pollsters have had Ohio as a four or five point race. I think that would be a good outcome for Sherrod Brown. I think he would win re-election if that's the outcome. I totally agree with his campaign though. If we're talking about Trump winning Ohio by 10, I'm not sure there are enough voters, crossover voters, even for somebody with his record um, to withstand that kind of rural turnout um, that could sweep across Ohio. So if I had to make a, um, a, a prediction right now, I would say that uh, Moreno is perhaps a slight favorite just because of where the trends are and where the spending is the last eight days at the national level. Um, but I think he has more than a fighting chance in terms of um, converting some of those voters that Trump is going to turn out into shared Brown voters. Dennis, any thoughts? Um, certainly not uh, on Ohio. I, I, as I say, I defer to Matt on that. He, uh, as you can, as you can see, um, really knows the state well and uh, has spent uh, more than a couple of campaigns there uh, on the ground. 
Um, one race that uh, I, I would raise uh, is certainly Montana, where the trend, I think, just two weeks ago was clearly going the wrong way for Democratic Senator John Tester. Um, but a couple of things that are important as it relates to Montana, two of which are, are, are two specific fact issues, one of which is uh, a question as to whether or not uh, Tim Sheehy, the Republican candidate, was medically discharged uh, from, uh, from the Navy. He is certainly a decorated uh, former Navy SEAL, uh, received a Bronze Star, uh, and uh, and certainly that can't be taken from him. But he has said on a number of occasions that he was medically discharged uh, without specifying what that was. In addition to that, uh, there is this question as to whether or not he was shot when he served in Afghanistan and potentially shot by friendly fire, not by enemy fire. Um, he asserted that uh, that that did happen, although there are now records out there of him uh, being accidentally shot, shot himself accidentally uh, after hiking in a, a national park. And there are records around all that. He was cited for it. And it has it has had some impact simply because Montana uh, is uh, is a limited early vote uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, you can certainly vote absentee there, but uh, the tradition in the state uh, nonetheless has been an election day vote. And so uh, there, there is some tightening. I don't want to be predictive here, but certainly some tightening uh, as that race moves on. And so what was as I say, I think two two to three weeks ago, and I would have even been among those conceding that race. I'm not conceding it now, uh, and certainly uh, election day will will tell the tale of that. Um, Go ahead. So you talk about ticket splitting. Um, you know, Dennis. Um, you know, there there has been some tightening in that Montana race. Emerson and the Hill, I think, had a poll out today, having um, Trump winning Montana by 19, and Sheehy winning Montana by four. So you do see that even in this very partisan uh, environment that these candidates are running in, there is the potential for real ticket splitting. And the final margin in a state, you know, how much does Trump win by might not matter a lot for the Electoral College in Montana or Ohio, um, but it could matter a whole heck of a lot in terms of control of the Senate. And I know you ask about Nebraska, um, and I'll just say really quickly on Nebraska, that's an example of a race where if you just look at it on paper, um, and certainly Republicans were caught by surprise there um, with the independent Mr. Osborne um, challenging their incumbent Republican Deb Fisher. Um, if you look at it on paper, there was a poll out today that had um, Fisher up 48-46 um, against the independent. Um, I, you know, I don't think there are many people I talk to that believe it's a two-point race right now that end up a two-point race. Um, I think people extrapolate, you know, based on what they've seen in the past. And there have been some examples of this where an independent comes out of nowhere, challenging an incumbent in a state where a Democrat or a Republican should be winning um, by a lot. And then they take them by surprise a little bit. It happened in Kansas a few cycles ago, um, I believe with um, Senator Moran. And, at the end of the day, um, these candidates generally wake up, they throw resources at the problem, and they fix their problem. Um, usually fixing the problem involves defining the independent as a Trojan horse that's going to caucus with the other party that is really a Democrat in disguise or a Republican in disguise, depending on if it's a red state or a blue state. Um, so I expect that race to fall the same way some of those past races have. But I will say it has forced Republicans to spend some time and energy in Nebraska. Otherwise, they they would have spent that time and energy and money somewhere else. So um, I would expect uh, Senator Fisher to win and retain that seat for Republicans. But certainly, um, it, it's been a little bit of a, a, a fire that Republicans had to put out there. I wonder, Dennis, what about Texas? Well, cer certainly, uh, again, a closer race than I think Republicans ever anticipated. Uh, as it relates to Colin Alred, uh, currently a House member, 
uh, and, um, and Ted Cruz. Um, I do think that uh, the polling now, uh, the most recent polls there, have it have Cruz up outside of the margin of error. But this is a much closer race than I think anyone ever anticipated uh, that would happen. I mean, is it possible, again, to the point that Matt made earlier about the, uh, the credibility of polls, uh, given the fact that even though it is uh, just outside the margin of error, uh, could that be uh, a, a, pick, a surprise pickup for Democrats? Certainly a possibility, though I'd acknowledge kind of unlikely. As he said, it's the the right now the polls are slightly outside of the margin of error in favor of Mr. Cruz. Um, I would expect him to win, um, but you know there was a New York Times Siena poll out today that had Trump up ten in Texas, which is a, a bigger gap than I would have expected. Um, eight days from election day. Um, and that same poll had Cruz up four. Um, you know, if if there is a really a six point delta between where Mr. Trump finishes in Texas and where Mr. Cruz finishes in Texas, that could be a very close race, in my opinion. So, um, you know, I would expect uh, uh, Senator Cruz to win. Um, but if the systematic, if the systemic error in polling that we talked about at the beginning um, happens, particularly with um, with women voters, um, if you're looking at a state like Texas, which has a, you know abortion on the ballot, um, I, I, you know that is one area where, like, if there is a true mistake, and let's say Republican women um, or independent women that typically vote Republican are coming out and they're voting for Colin Allred. Um, that could all of a sudden be a pretty close race. So that's that's certainly one to watch on election night. Chad, you had a uh, you had a question. It's just two things on Texas. I agree. Interesting that Harris went to Houston, which I believe is in Harris County. Is that right? It is Harris County. <laughs> I don't know if that factored into her decision, but I know, I know. Well, it's also a very blue city, large African American population. I mean, you have San Antonio, I think Dallas, Austin. I do wonder if Texas at some point does come into play. Uh, it would be so refreshing to have it become one of the, the swing states, if you will, because it's so big and so diverse. But the other point I want to make is, having been from Nebraska, lived there for a while, Deb Fisher went to my high school, uh, Omaha, uh, and the second district there, the so-called blue dot, my understanding is there are signs in the Omaha area, where my dad was from, that just have a blue dot, and that somehow Nebraska which has a unicameral legislature, but also rewards its, correct me if I'm wrong, its electoral votes proportionally to, to the actual number if Nebraska could actually come into play if it is this close. You, you know, you're absolutely right. So I'll, I'll give you an example, and, and I hope my math doesn't get fact-checked in real time here. Um, but um, I would expect that Nebraska second district to go for um, Vice President Harris. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think all the polling and just the momentum I, I think she is going to win that one electoral vote there. Um, so one interesting thing is is Nebraska thought about changing or maybe attempted to change their um, their the way those um, electoral votes are split about a month and a half ago. Um, it ended up being rejected. They didn't end up doing that. But um, I'll give you one scenario, a, a scenario I believe where um, Mr. Trump wins Arizona, uh, Georgia, and North Carolina. He wins Maine's. Um, one of Maine's votes, which also splits, right. um, but loses the the one in Nebraska too. I believe it's two seventy to two sixty eight for Harris. Um, so that one to one split would be the difference between the election going to the House of Representatives as a two sixty nine two sixty nine tie, where President Trump would likely win uh, because of the majority of states delegations versus a you know a two point. Uh, victory for Miss Harris. So that is it's a fascinating thing to think about. But, uh, you know, who knows, maybe we'll wake up on, on next Wednesday morning and and be talking about that a little bit more seriously. But I'm glad you mentioned um, uh, the vice president's trip to Texas, because we do get a lot of questions about that. Um, I don't think that they believe Texas is in play this time. It's always like one of those maybe next time. Um, but I do think it did help um, their campaign highlight one of their closing messages on abortion um, because of what's on the ballot in Texas. So uh, I think it helped with that. I think, um, you know, they wanted a big event where they could get 
uh, Beyonce have a star studded event and, and Houston seemed like a good place for it. Um, maybe they were thinking about helping Colin Allred um, a little bit across the finish line. Um, so that's possible as well. Um, but we get the same questions on the Republican side about um, President Trump going to Madison Square Garden uh, yesterday, about President Trump is going to Salem, Virginia and Albuquerque, New Mexico um, in the final week. I just I tell people, you know, usually not to read too much into that. Um, these campaigns like the narrative generally that their candidate has all the momentum, they're winning, feel good, you know, everybody get behind us because we're expanding the map. The number of times the map gets expanded is not all that frequent. Um, so I would be pretty surprised if um, if Trump wins in Virginia or New Mexico. Uh, but I think it or if or if Harris wins in Texas, but I think it helps generate this narrative that we have all the momentum. Join us, you know. You're right to be enthusiastic about us as things, uh, you know, come down to the end and everything's going our way and is on our side. Helps with fundraising. It helps with uh, volunteers and things like that. So um, I, I'm glad you brought it up because we we do get that question quite a bit. Um, Dennis uh, and, and Mitch. Since uh, you mentioned Matt, uh, you campaigned for JD Vance in, in the past, and and uh, in the beginning of this uh, cycle, it seemed like the vice presidential nominees were getting a lot of um, tension, which, uh, as things as things normally go, they they sort of disappear after a while. But you know, to what extent will the uh, will they have any impact on on these races? Well, it's a great question, you know, Governor. I mean, I think everybody loves to Monday morning quarterback when it comes to politics. So I'm not surprised that um, you know, for both vice presidential picks, you had people, um, sometimes operatives that get paid to push for other people in their party. Um, saying, oh, you know, that was a mistake or or you should have picked X or Y or Z. I think you're seeing that a little bit on both sides. Um, I actually think Americans were pretty happy about um, the vice presidential debate that happened. Um, you know, the, it was kind of interesting at the end. They were um, it seemed like it, it was a lot friendlier um, than the presidential debate. It seemed like, you know, two people from the Midwest that were um, had a, have a lot of policy differences, but um, could agree to disagree. Um, you know, I was a little bit surprised of, of the, the some people's positive reactions towards that. Um, so, look, I mean, I think both um, uh, um, um, both nominees for vice president um, bring something to the ticket that the ticket didn't already have. Um, I think in terms of J.D. Vance, it's youth. Um, you know, he's he just turned 40. And it shows, you know, um, obviously having a presidential nominee that is, um, you know, it, I think would be the one of the oldest, you know, when they started their term um, in Donald Trump versus having a very young um, vice president um, is good. And I think there's a there. I think voters want that at the end of the day. They don't necessarily want these specific candidates, but I think they want, um, you know, people of, of different generations to be involved in governing. Um, so I think that's been a positive. I think um, one of the reasons that um, that Donald Trump picked J.D. Vance is he he sees him as a avid defender of um, his policies as a good spokesperson um, for some of the policies that um, Donald Trump wants to carry out. So, um, you know, and I think the third thing is just the Rust Belt. Right. We all know how important Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania are. And, you know, the fact that J.D. Vance grew up in um, in Ohio and in, in kind of the Appalachia part of um, Ohio, um, I think, is something that gives him um, some credibility when talking to some of those voters. So I think, th you know, those are some of the reasons why um, he's been a, 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 a good pick, um, in my opinion. Um, but certainly, you know, there are a lot of people that are going to second guess whoever you pick. And I think you're see you see that on the Democratic side, too. It's a question we get a lot is, you know, if Pennsylvania is so important, why did um, why did Kamala Harris pick um, somebody from Minnesota instead of, a, uh, you know, Governor Shapiro from Pennsylvania? And, you know, these campaigns, geez, they get paid a lot of money. They, there are a lot of very smart people involved in these decisions, and they're usually not made. Um, without due consideration and polling and a lot of different factors going into it. So, um, you know, that's I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I think um, I, I I think 
time time will tell sometimes when you go back and you look at a at a VP selection. Um, I think, you know, in 2008, people certainly looked back and said, Sarah Palin, um, you know, what was John McCain thinking? I think some of John McCain's advisors said, what were we thinking? Um, and, you know, sometimes you just get it wrong. Um, but I don't think 2024 is going to be one of those times where we look back and say um, a, a race was won or lost based on who the um, VP nominee was. Dennis, anything? Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I would say on that is I, I can't recall a race where the vice president ended up getting the president elected. And um, and certainly, uh, you know, to Matt's point about an awful lot of data and research going into the selection, I think actually this year demonstrates the fact that what really drove the selection was the way that the presidential candidate felt personally about the candidate that they selected. Um, and and you can you can certainly see that just in terms of everybody believed that, oh, it was going to be Mark Kelly, the Democratic senator from Arizona, or oh, it was going to be Governor Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania. And nobody really had Tim Waltz on their radar. And at the end of the day, just in terms of the people who I talked to, it was much more about how the the vice president felt in all of her meetings, and she felt more comfortable with Tim Vaults and felt that they, she had a better connection with him as it relates to that. And I think that that's you know going back to Matt's example with uh, with Sarah Palin, I think in just in a couple of books that I read, which I don't pretend to be really well connected with Republican uh, uh, election consultants, it was much more about McCain's just personal reaction in the uh, admittedly very, very short time they spent together before he made that decision. Well, I, I'm not, I might have, remember one race where the vice presidential candidate made a difference, possibly with John F. Kennedy mm. when, he, when he picked uh, when he picked Lyndon Johnson. Right. That that might have been uh, may have been the last time that a vice president actually mattered. I think that's a great point. I mean, I think 20, 2000 was was very close. Obviously, I think Joe Lieberman was a bit of an appeal, knowing that Florida was going to be close, and you know it didn't didn't quite pan out at the end of the day. But that could have been, you know, that could, could have, have been, been the other one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Any any other questions for these gentlemen, uh, Chad or uh, Colin and uh, Jay? You know we haven't heard you at all. Oh, I have a ton of questions, John. But I you're never silent. Better, hey, yeah. You well, go ahead. But no, I think it's better that you move on to the second part of the show now. Anyway, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining us and for this in-depth discussion of the national race uh, and. Uh, I guess I'm as um, not confused. I, I, you know, I, I am as uh, um, not sure <laughs> of of things as when we uh, maybe more so now, and that's probably because of the insights that you all gave us. This is going to be a historic uh, moment in in a week or so, and so thank you for joining us. And uh, maybe we'll do this again after the election and, and see how close this conversation actually came to reality. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate Thank you, having you with us. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye. Bye. Where are we? <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, that the, I think it was Dennis who started off saying he's never seen such a, a close election. I mean, and this is someone who's been in politics for a very long time. I mean, you can, it's true in the Senate. It's, we didn't even talk about the House. That seems Oh, like yeah, we got some great House too. races, I mean, no one, too. There, it, it could go either way there. I mean, I think it is, uh, it, it's just, it's remarkable how closely divided this country is. And, and how uh, two very different campaigns that have approached this entirely different ways. I mean, I think if I were to sum up that, I mean, Trump's strategy is always a little unique, but I mean, really, he's gone for a turn out the MAGA base strategy, double down on his messaging. And I think Harris really has done much of what she can to kind of moderate the more uh, uh, 
some of the more liberal positions and try to show that her campaign is sort of a safe space for former Republicans or independents. She did these interesting campaign events with Liz Cheney. But at the end of the day, it's still it's still completely tied. And you, you, if you look on the internet or social media, you see all of these people, especially on the Democratic side, saying, how, how is it possible that this is still is still so close? Um, and uh, it, it, it is it is remarkable how deeply people are dug in to their positions and how little anything has shifted uh, since since Biden was a candidate and since Harris first announced her candidacy. You know, um, it seems interesting that I, I saw a little bit of uh, James uh, J Carville on uh, television yesterday. I don't remember the channel. My wife called me and said, you know, your your friend Carville's on right now. And, you know, I, I remember him from the good old days when the, you know, when the Clinton era was around. And uh, and what it was, it was really, what was really interesting to me was the fact that he was talking about how, you know, we got this bunch of 8%. It's only the real small part of our party uh, that's the so-called real left wing. You know, the, we're not there. And he was going out of his way to point out that the elite from uh, Los Angeles who may have taken control of the uh, the image of the party for the last so many years. We're really not us, you know, and we got to stop this. More important than the argument is winning. And which was the message for Clinton as well. As, as you know, he was famous for shifting to the middle. But um, that's a problem Democrats have. That uh, that really, the, one of the things about the Republican part, side of the, the equation is they may talk about the rhinos and all of this, but it's just a way of keeping everybody in, bringing them back, not pushing them out. Yeah. You know, and uh, I thought uh, that was kind of an interesting thing. Trump is not, or his consultants are not going around saying, you know, we got this nut fringe in our, uh, in our, uh, uh, in our support base that uh, likes Nazis. You know, he doesn't say that. Uh, but here was uh, James Caldwell saying that. You know. What's your uh, prognosis, Chad? Well, I do think race and gender will ultimately be decisive factors in this race. We're going to see with the abortion vote and how significant that will be. Um, I'm thinking more the uncomfortableness for some men, many men, and some women uncomfortable with electing a woman president. Um, this is not my view. This is, a, but I think a very strong view. You saw what Tarka Carlson, of all people, is saying at Madison Square Garden about the daddy figure and whatnot. I mean, we can pick those arguments apart. But then the race element as well, and the stuff that came out in Madison Square Garden about, again, with Tucker Carlson calling her Samoan and I don't know Malaysian or something. I, I, that's the stuff that makes my stomach churn more than just about anything. Is that we're in 2024. And that race and and gender can still be. I, I admit I'm naive here and I'm idealistic, but it just makes me sick to to hear what happened yesterday. It has been happening all along. The enemy within, the vermin, the bloodlines, and all that. Uh, and then just you know she's retarded. Uh, it just I, it's a, shocking to me that we're hearing this at such a a level uh, in 2024. I'm going to say to follow up on uh, on Chad's analysis here. I mean, one of the to me more surprising things that you've seen in this race, and and why Harris and President Obama are pushing so hard, is that there has been a surprising amount of movement to Trump by Black and Latino men. I mean, you're seeing this gender divide is just huge, and I think that is something that has really caught uh, Democrats off guard. I mean, there was a little bit of evidence that this was happening earlier. Um, in the last presidential race. Um, but I think this is something that they have been found very unexpected, the extent to which um, it, it has happened. And I think it's, you know, now they're having to, to try to persuade some of these voters who should, or usually natural Democratic voters to come to come back to the fold. Jay? I have trouble distancing myself individually about how I feel about this, you know. Colin said it was remarkable indeed in my life, which is, you know, long these days. 
I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything nearby. I mean, can you imagine talking about the sex habits of Arnold Palmer and the sex habits of, of Puerto Ricans in New York? It is so tacky. And yet there are people that would vote for a guy that does that. And your, your list is of terribles, Chad. I mean, it, it's a longer list than that, isn't it? I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I didn't bring up religion, and that absolutely is an element as well. I think that's where you're going. If I'm if I'm wrong, correct me. But the whole Hitler thing, the 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 bloodlines, um, that Jews would be out of their heads to vote uh, Democrat. I I just I mean, you're hitting the three buttons: religion, gender, and race, right there, uh, and none of it is pretty. It's madness. It's madness. And, and what's what's also madness is the fact that half the country would vote for him. And so it'll be close. And and that's the part that that escapes me. I mean, what kind of an electorate do we have? How have things changed since the last time we looked at in a in a rational way at, at national politics? I mean, this is really unique and it it portends tragedy. It portends a strange deal with Putin. It portends arresting people and incarcerating them for their views. It the end of the First Amendment, um, millions of people being deported. All of this is a real possibility, and and I I just can't wrap my head around it. The other thing is, you know, we had in the first part of the show all this discussion about the battleground states and the individual candidates. I don't know about you guys, but I get mm, somewhere over five hundred emails a day from all of those guys. And they say, I'm drowning, I'm I'm, I'm gonna lose, I, I don't know what to do, I'm so sad. If you send me $5, it'll help me. You can help, you can help me beat off, um, you know, the Republicans or whatever it is. I get Republican mail too. And I'm saying to myself, gee, I mean, this is no favor to anybody. <clears throat> it clogs up my mailbox. I can't, I can't find my regular mail anymore. Because I have hundreds of these things coming through, all begging for money. Everybody wants money. And indeed, it's the most expensive political experience the country has ever seen. You know, it must be what I, you tell me, it's a trillion dollars already. You know, when you add up all these races and all the, you know, the contributions and all the fantastic spending and the billionaires coming in with outrageous contributions that make Citizens United look like it is really the law of the land. Um, I'm, I'm so upset about this. And I, and I'm not, I wouldn't bet against Trump. I would not want Trump to win by any means, but I would not bet against him. And the other thing I feel is that, um, you know, it has an effect. Uh, Trump has an effect on the down ballot races, for sure. It's not only that, you know, that he's endorsing Republican candidates in some of these, or maybe many of these races. It's that they follow him. He's the leader. He's, what is it, daddy? Daddy? The, uh, oh, my God. Um, the other thing is, and this goes to your original point, Chad, the, the, the thing we have here is very sophisticated ads for which somebody pays a ton of money. We are all paying a ton of money. It's part of that huge budget for this huge industry that's going on for eight years at least. And, you know, is this how we should be spending our money and our time? I mean, we, we really lost our way. We collectively, the country, have lost our way. <clears throat> and finally, your point about polls. You know, I think that polls actually have an effect. Mm. If I read about a poll, it's, it favors one candidate or another. I say, hmm, that's a legitimate candidate because the poll treats that candidate as legitimate. And, and then what happens is you have this kind of magical spin um, where people who see the polls vote uh, or their vote is affected by what the poll is saying about about the candidates. And that turns it. And social media turns it. And the press turns it. I mean, wow. You know, if you went back to both the Post and the Times over the past few years, you could see that they were developing all these agenda. And um, I don't think they've done a good job collectively. I think the public is really not informed. You know, you know, in many states, the Republicans have cut civics out of the out of the uh, the, the curriculum. 
Um, they don't want to hear about that. And so we have a whole generation of kids coming up that don't know. And I'm hoping, there was an article yesterday, I'm hoping that at least some of the ones just coming of age now will be able to see this clearly. But I am not confident. It's really interesting, though, Jay, that uh, when they did some polling among the colleges, that the, uh, that the worst uh, kinds of things that we are afraid of happening or are happening didn't seem to take root among young people. I mean, they, they, they were completely different. Uh, I, I don't know whether that means we might have a better future or, or why well, I have no idea. I think, um, you know, the country has changed. The political process has changed. These campaigns have changed. You know, um, everybody here has observed them for a long time. And you'll have to agree this one's really different. But the question is going forward. What is going to happen? Um, you know, for example, the vice president may not be a salient feature in the election of the president, but the vice president for a guy who's, uh, you know, what, 79 or 80 or whatever. It's, Could be the next president. Any day, any day of the week. And then, of course, he could be the next president after that term is over. Um, uh, if that term is ever over, I'm not sure that it will ever actually be over. Um, so what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is the whole calculus has changed. We could have a vice president who lies. We could have a vice president who turns into the president, who denies the 2020 election. I mean, it's different now, and it will always be different. I don't think we can go back. Uh, well, let me uh, say one thing um, uh, as kind of a question for all of us. Let's say that our worst fears happen, whatever they are, you know, and, and what does that mean? Well, let's know. Let's make it more specific. Trump wins the election. The Republicans take the Senate uh, and, and the House. I mean, they, they take the Congress. And so our, what we... Uh, all the things that people fear start to happen. What does that mean for Hawaii? Where does that put us? Uh, a anybody want to try and tackle that? Well, I've been thinking about that. I think it will affect everyone in the country. These are national issues, and the national issues will affect Hawaii. Furthermore, there are people around that will make sure the national issues affect Hawaii, people in the legislature, people from the, from the mainland who will put pressure on Hawaii to follow whatever that president wants and is doing. So <clears throat> I think Hawaii will be profoundly affected. And I went to see my doctor a couple of days ago and I said, you know, I'm really anxious about this election. And she said, don't worry about it because, because Trump can never win in Hawaii. And, so, yes. and that's, that's the view we have. <laughs> That's the view we have. Um, okay, Trump doesn't win in Hawaii, but Trump, if he wins nationally, will govern all the states. I mean, I, I agree with Jay. Hawaii would also be profoundly affected in, in some ways. I mean, we're de very dependent on federal spending here. I think in some ways we might also be a little bit protected because the federal spending we receive is very much connected to the military. And I don't have any sense that that Trump is going to reduce the military presence um, in the Pacific, that might be a, an odd way to to answer that question. But I um, I I don't expect, although I could be wrong. I mean, there's lots of horrific things that could happen. That there'll be uh, attempts to to punish the blue states. I mean, maybe some like California, um, but it's very difficult to try to restrict federal funding this way. I think that my guess is that people. My biggest fear is that there will be an absolute inability to govern. Um, I think that the Republican Party, if they take control of both the House and Senate, have not the, the current Republican Party has not shown much evidence uh, that they can govern, even when they have a majority. Be, um, I think that the divisions among themselves will become more obvious. I think the the sense of that the deep state, that the federal bureaucracy is is the enemy. Um, I think I mean this was part of the. Um, uh, uh, the the now infamous heritage. Um, uh, report on reforming the federal government. Uh, I really do fear that attack on the federal bureaucracy will make the federal government that we all depend on um, unable to deliver 
basic services in some ways. If you begin to fire all of the senior bureaucrats who actually know what's going on and replace them with party hacks, which is very close to some of the proposals I've seen coming out of the Trump administration, um, I, I, I think that's going to be an absolute disaster for everyone and for us. I mean, and there's going to be more obvious things. I mean, we, you know, when we've already talked about the potential for um, well, political enemies to be, to, you know, to use the, the the actual power of the federal government to chase down political enemies and things like that. Um, but my real concern is that the federal government just won't be able to deliver on basic services after a while if if there really is this attempt to try to gut the federal bureaucracy. Uh, you know, it, it's one of the things that I find most frustrating, among other things, with these Republican talking points. I mean, this crazy idea that somehow Elon Musk is going to leave the Department of Government efficiency and get rid of all of these federal employees and save us trillions of dollars. Most people have no understanding of what the federal government does, how professional and dedicated professional um, federal civil servants are, um, and getting rid of them. I mean, there was a tiny attempt to do this in the first administration, but I think the people around Trump are far more um, determined to do this this time. Um, will, will um, I mean, I think will have real lived effects for many, many Americans, many of whom are Trump voters who rely directly on federal uh, services. Let me, let me just, uh, synth you know, synthesize some of those things. Number one is it's a close election nationally. No question about it. I mean, you, you got to believe the polls, although I, I agree with Chad. I don't think we should have polls, um, but um, it will be a very close election. Second thing is that Trump and his friends are definitely going to deny any election that goes for Harris, any election that goes for Harris, because, not only because it's a close result, but because he's planning to do that, even if it wasn't a close result. And part of that program is the end of democracy. It's the end of representative government. I was shocked this morning to read that in the city of Portland, which I'm not sure where Portland goes on the on the scale of red and blue, but in the city of Portland, there have been people who are burning mailboxes and they have lost hundreds of votes because of that. And so we have suppression, we have manipulation, we have the whole question about um, you know, the electoral college and and what the, the House could do to flip it. Um, I think democracy, representative government uh, is in tremendous, tremendous risk right now and will continue to be through a Trump term. Chad, you got it. Uh, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I know we're almost out of time. Uh, Portland, Oregon, definitely blue. Uh, but right outside of it, definitely red. <laughs> and you're right, they were blowing up uh, lock, uh, drop boxes. I'll just say one final thing. We're not done yet. Um, this time, though, the Democrats are prepared legally, uh, just as the Republicans are. And this is going to go down. It is a national thing, but also is state by state, precinct by precinct. And I think uh, we're just getting started because uh, Trump will not give up, even if... <laughs> I don't think he's going to win in a landslide. I don't think she is either. But um, I have a feeling we're just getting started. And, and that's what uh, kind of keeps me up. Wow. Well, guys, we're going to see. <laughs> Sorry. You know, we're, we're going to see. Um, yeah, it's uh, we got pundits, uh, I mean, people right across America talking about win or lose, no matter who wins or who loses. Uh, or, or, or and who loses, that America will never be the same. And, uh, you know, and I don't know if that's a way to end the show. I, I was really trying to find, you know, there was a silver lining in all of this. And you went but, to me for that point? I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, you, you, why not? Well, after Jay, after listening to Jay, but um, I'm I, I I'm trying to remain optimistic uh, about a lot of things. But this is truly a uh, unusual, highly unique. I hate to use those cliches, historic time, but it is uncharted territory. Yet another cliche. Right. So well, let me let me close my thoughts by just saying it's been great knowing all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. To find a silver <laughs> lining here, Jay. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. And we want to thank all of the people out there who have uh, uh, listened to us, uh, listened to this discussion uh, this uh, this morning. And um, 
you know, hopefully, hopefully uh, the world will uh, be better uh, somehow. With that, we will return in, in the very near future and discuss where we are at that time. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for watching Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii.